This morning, we're going to be continuing on in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I've titled today's message, Finishing Well is Everything. So while you're turning there, while you're trying to get to that area there in your, in your Bibles, uh, I saw this interesting story that has a lot to do with today's message. At the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, an hour after the winner had already crossed the finish line, a few thousand spectators remained there at the stadium, at the stadium there, to watch the last bunch of exhausted marathon runners being carried off to the first aid stations. As the remaining spectators prepared to leave, they began to hear the sound of sirens and police whistles towards one of the gates. So they turned and towards that gate, and they noticed that a single runner wearing the colors of Tanzania was entering the stadium. His name was John Stephen Akawari. I know I butchered his name, but now because of a fall that had occurred to him earlier in the race, one of his legs had been completely bandaged and noticeably covered in blood. And so as he's running and, you know, through this track, his final lap there at the, at the stadium, you could tell by the grimace in his face that each step that he took was just excruciatingly painful. But he just continued on and just hobbled around that 400 meter track. And out of all the runners, he was the last man to finish. But that didn't matter to any of the spectators that stuck around. They stood up and applauded him and cheered him as though he was the winner. After crossing the finish line, Akahawari slowly walked off the field. In view of his injury and having no chance of winning a medal, someone asked him why he just hadn't quit. And this is what he said. This was his response. My country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish it. Well, my friends, in this Christian life, finishing well means everything. As Paul faced execution, he wrote to Timothy and told him there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now regarding this verse, a Christian writer wrote this. As Paul writes to Timothy and contemplates his impending death, he evaluates his life and ministry. While we live in a culture that exalts the winner and scorns the loser, Paul assesses his life based on three things. He fought the good fight, he finished the course, and he kept the faith. How interesting that there's no mention of winning, only that of fighting, finishing, and keeping. Now, I, I mention this to you all because we are so prone to think of ourselves as failures when we don't set records or win things or become overachievers or we just do something great that will, you know, achieve, for instance, social media fame. But for Paul, most likely the greatest Christian who ever lived, it was a matter of endurance. See, for Paul... He won by lasting. 
well, concerned that some of his readers wanted to quit the race, he exhorted them in last week's passage, if you were with us, not to give up by explaining the benefit of God's discipline. So now, as you will see in a bit, by writing the word, therefore, in verse 12, he's going to point back. He's pointing back to what he just said about the need to endure God's discipline. That, as verse 10 says, it stems from his love and it's, and it's uh, designed for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. And as verse 2 said, we must look to the greatest example, Jesus, who for the joy that lay before, before him endured the cross. So now in the passage that we're going to be covering today, he's going to continue to encourage weary believers to finish the race well. Finishing the race is everything. Now, he's going to continue to do that by expounding the race metaphor just a little bit further. And will then offer specific advice on what to do and what to guard against in order to finish well. And so today's message hopefully will show you that in order to finish the race well of the Christian faith, you need to clear all obstacles. You need to encourage one another and heed the warning of Scripture's negative examples. And so before we begin reading today's passage, there in Hebrews chapter 12, let's pray and ask the Lord to move powerfully. Lord, we are thankful that you brought us here, that you have a plan and purpose for today, for right now, Lord. And I pray that you will reveal it clearly and undoubtedly, Lord. Pray for those watching and listening that you will bless them as well. That you will show them what it is they need to know. They will hear what it is that you need to tell them. Or some of us are really tired of, of this race, of this long marathon, Lord. But we know that you are the one that ran it. You ran it well. You ran it perfectly. And because of that, you give us the ability to. Or so I just pray right now that you will, that this message will go out to those who are tired, who are weary, who just want to give up. This message will encourage them. That your word will speak powerfully to them through your Holy Spirit. I love you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll be picking up in verse 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees. And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but healed instead. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. And make sure that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, even though he sought it with tears, because he didn't find any opportunity for repent repentance. As I mentioned uh, a bit ago, the writer used the word race here as a metaphor to describe how the spiritual life of a believer is like a long-distance marathon. 
And even though we will hit that wall that runners so typically do when they run marathons, we are called to tough it out, realizing that the hardships we endure are disciplines that enable us to share in God's holiness. And so like a good coach, he now begins to motivate his tired and weary readers by instructing us to do four things in order to keep running this long spiritual race. His first instruction is found in verses 12 and 13, which is basically this. Keep running. Keep running and inspire others to do the same. If any of you have ever run a long, just any kind of long distance run, or have been towards the end of a long distance race, you really can tell how tired a person is by just looking at their arms and legs. Those without any energy that are completely spent and completely gassed out, they will droop their arms or you know their arms will start doing this and they will flop their hands and also their knees. You look at their knees, they're going to begin wobbling. They'll have wobbling knees, which will begin to reduce that runner's stride. These signs were proverbial in biblical culture for mental and spiritual slowdown. Good examples of this, and you can read them on your own, but um, Isaiah mentions this same um, metaphor in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 and 4. And also Job mentions it in chapter 4, in Job chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And so here the preacher, again, like a good attentive coach, exhorts his readers in verse... 12, strengthen your hands, or strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees. The command to strengthen comes from the root word, from, comes from the word which we derive our English word orthopedic. And so the sense is make upright and straight. But here's how a modern coach would actually probably say, verse 12, straighten up, get those hands up and those feet, feet up. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Now, let me just say this. Now, in no way is the writer promoting a do-it-yourself, bootstrap Christian life. But Christians must tough it out by God's grace. Our lives as believers will be full of repeated hardships that often come as divine discipline. So you're going to have to be strong and you have to be determined, just like those runners in a marathon. Now, toughing it out is essential, but there's, but there's more to the idea, to this idea, because this toughness isn't meant to be a solo venture. In the next verse, the writer alludes to Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 through 27. As he calls his people to corporate toughness and helping one another to run well. He says there in that verse, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but healed instead. In the Greek, the word straight is referring to the idea of putting the paths in better order so as to make the race easier for the lame, so that the lame may not be disabled, or as our, our passage here says, dislocated. So the point is, 
every consideration should be made to help everyone finish the race. The church should include not only the weak assisting the weak, but also the strong teaming up with the weak. This is something the writer mentions several times. He already mentioned several times in this letter, especially back in chapter 3, verse 13, where he said, encourage each other daily while it's still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Now, in my honest opinion, I believe there is a greater joy in finishing together. There's a double joy. Sure, we have to be tough. We have to gut it out by God's grace. But we also have to hang tough together. The strong among us must hold up the dangling hands and wobbling knees of the weak with our prayers and acts of mercy. Those who are strong must make straight paths for the weak by the exemplary direction of their lives. The lives of the strong must keep the weak on the right road. Their lives must never cause the weak to stumble. We have to keep running strong, my fellow believer. And we also have to run strong together. Well, as a writer moves on, he gives the second, third, and fourth words of inspirational advice, which is live holy lives. In verse 14, he says, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Now, when he says all men, the author is including not, jo- not just those within the walls of this church, but also those outside the church. Yes, even when they're persecuting you. As Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28, love, love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. (laughs) Let me repeat those words again. Love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Ladies and gentlemen, those aren't easy words to obey. They apply to wives who have husbands who are verbally abusive and vice versa. They apply to believers who have family members who ridicule their faith or provoke them in an attempt to get them to deny their testimony. Apply to Christian teenagers who have classmates that make fun of them because of their faith, because they've decided not to do something because it goes against their Christian values. They apply to Christians who work with people who just can't stand them because of their faith, who spread falsehoods about them behind their backs. But perhaps the most difficult place to apply these words, however, is towards fellow Christians who have wronged you. Sure, yeah, we can expect the world to act like the world. When unbelievers are verbally abusive or slander you, 
you tend to think, or we tend to think, well, they don't know the Lord. However, when Christians do that, we're shocked. We're hurt. Why? Because we expect, we expect that from pagans. But we don't expect that from our fellow brother and sister in Christ. But it happens all the time. And it's one of Satan's effective tools to sideline new believers. Get somebody in the church to spread false rumors or say insensitive things about that new believer and watch him or her drop out of the race. Now, there's also an important part of this verse that we mustn't ignore. And that is where it says we must pursue, pursue peace with all men. Pursue is a strong word that means in some context to persecute. It means to go after, uh, it means to go after peace with the effort that a hunter tracks, tracks down his prey. It implies a concentrated effort, and it's intentional. And so here's the idea. When someone hurts you, your tendency is to withdraw and to lick your wounds. You put up a wall of protection around, your spe- around yourself, especially toward that mean person so that it doesn't happen again. And then it becomes easy to distance yourself from the one who hurt you and from everyone who believed that person's cruel lies. And then you just avoid talking to them. But here, what the author is saying is pursue peace with that person. Make an intentional effort to do that, to pursue peace with that person who hurt you. And this isn't only the only time the New Testament, in the New Testament that we're told to pursue peace. In Romans chapter 14, verse 19, Paul wrote, Let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Also in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, citing Psalm 34, verse 14, Peter wrote, that the one who desires life and loves to see good days must turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. In this same verse, the author also exhorts to pursue holiness and warns us that no one will see the Lord without it. Thus, holiness is required. It's required for the believer. Holiness isn't a mark of unregenerate, not born again uh, people, nor is it a mark of those who are falling away and failing to run the race of the Christian faith. Here, the author is using the term holiness to describe those who are pursuing the Lord. Now, this doesn't mean that those who run are perfect or sinless. But it does mean that they are fighting sins and living faithfully. No one will see the Lord without his holiness, which makes the moral imperative to make straight paths for our feet eternally significant. Verse 15, he continues to instruct us to live holy lives by telling believers, by telling you and I to make sure that no one in the community of faith, falls short of the grace of God. 
Well, we may think that the grace of God uh, is an ev- in an evangelistic sense. This is not the author's focus here. He is speaking of the ongoing grace of God, which believers experience through the preaching of the word and the Christian disciplines. In this context of the new covenant community, the readers are called to watch over one another. From the weakest brother to the strongest. So that all in their midst will grow in holiness and obtain the grace of God. He also commands his people to see it, to, to see it that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. As believers, as Christians, we must be on guard against the person of bitterness. It's a, t- it's a deadly contagion. And it's a sign of serious spiritual trouble. It's an on-ramp to the way of sin, not the way of righteousness. Tearing apart the church as it spreads. Now, we don't necessarily make a cognitive decision to become bitter. It isn't something that we think in our minds, you know what, I'm just going to be bitter right now. I'm just going to be angry. I'm going to be bitter at that person. But when a wrong happens and we allow that wrong to fester just enough, well, it's going to take root. It's going to take root to the heart. And so before that happens, we must stop bitterness at the root where it's going to spread to others in the church and begin to defile us, begin to corrupt us. And again, not just here in this local church, but just the church in general. Believers. And finally, in verse 16, he encouraged us to live holy lives by making sure there isn't any immoral or irreverent person. While other forms of immorality certainly exist, the Bible addresses sexual sin with particular candor. See, we live in a day that minimizes sexual sin. It's no big deal. Go ahead and sleep with that person or, that, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you just, it's no, it's no big deal. But the Bible, the word of God maximizes it, maximizes its severity. Why? Why is the Bible so tough on sexual immorality? Well, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body or her own body. Sexually, sexual immorality, my friends, not only violates the law of God, but it also defiles our own bodies. Which 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, are temples of the Holy Spirit. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so when you go out there and start to sleep around with different people, what do you think you're doing to that temple? The Holy Spirit's temple. Reality is you're defiling it. In the same breath, in the, same breath the author tells us also 
not to be irreverent like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. You know, some of you are familiar with the story, and some of you aren't. But before I explain it, I need to ask this question. Is there a relationship between Esau and sexual immorality? Well, Scripture give us, gives us no indication that Esau was sexually immoral. So it doesn't seem that the combination is meant to point to Esau's sexual sin. Rather, the conjunction in the sentence, sexually immoral or irreverent like Esau, indicates the strong relationship between sexual immorality and irreverence. Thus, when you look at it this way, they're both markers of unfaithfulness to God. Like those listed in the previous chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, the example of Esau is meant to encourage us to persevere in the faith. Yet, we're not encouraged, we're not encouraged to imitate his example were to avoid it at all cost, for his example wasn't one of faithfulness to God. Rather, Esau traded away his birthright in order to alleviate the physical discomfort of hunger. Again, that story is found in Genesis chapter 25. For him, a single meal was more important than his birthright that belonged, that actually belonged to him as the firstborn of Isaac, his father. Trading it away to Jacob, again, they were twins, Jacob and Esau. Esau was born first, and so he had that birthright as the firstborn son and so trading away to his twin brother, his younger brother Jacob, demonstrated his disinterest, not just for his birthright, but for the holy things of God. In fact, Moses says that Esau's actions show that he despised his birthright. In Genesis chapter 5, 25, verse 34, Thus, the author of Hebrews appropriately identifies Esau, Esau as irreverent, unfaithful, and unworthy of our emulation. Why? So why does the author regard the selling of birthright as unholy? Well, Esau's privileged position as Isaac's firstborn son designated him as the one who was to bear the responsibility of the family and to carry his father's name and role after Isaac's death. Having such an honor and privilege was a direct result of God's sovereign choice. And so when he gave it away like that, like it was no big deal, he had to take my birthright. I'm just hungry. Give me, give me the food. What he did was unthinkable. It was a crime not only against his family, but also against God, the one who bestowed the birthright on Esau. He committed the offense willingly, he did not give up. He did not give it up by force. He let the appetite of his belly lead him into a serious, into a serious offense against God. Now, this isn't the end of Esau's story, though. After trading away his birthright for a bowl of stew, Esau longed to receive the blessing of the firstborn from his father. He wanted it back. He realized he had messed up. Jacob, however, deceiving Isaac, 
received it instead. And when Esau learned of the blessing he had lost to his brother, it says in Genesis chapter 27, verse 34, that he bitterly begged his father to bless him as well. But it was too late. It was too late because the original blessing, it couldn't be revoked. It couldn't be taken back. Folks, there are many today who are Christians just for the benefits. If God uh, will give them a happy marriage and family life, good health, and a comfortable lifestyle, they'll pay their dues to God and the church. But if life becomes difficult, if severe trials hit, they start shopping elsewhere for whatever works. But really, their allegiance isn't to God. It's to themselves. If they can use God to get what they want, they'll do it. But if God isn't working, they'll just move on. So, as you can see, I hope you see, in all reality, they're just like Esau. They desire the blessing, but they aren't interested in the joy that the psalmist knew when he wrote in Psalm chapter, in Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26, who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Is that you? Is that your heart? Or is, do you have a heart like Esau? If it is like Esau, at the end of this message, I'm going to give you an opportunity to turn back, to repent. But if you do have that heart of just, you have that allegiance to God, you have that love to God, if you're tired and weary, Get up. Keep running. Finishing well, my friends, is everything. Now, Esau also stands as an example of someone who regrets what he's done or she's done, but doesn't truly repent of his wrongdoing. Now, some of you may not know what the difference between Regret and repent, repentance really is. Well, hopefully here you'll begin to understand. See, there's a big difference between regret and repentance. See, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, God never rejects true repentance, but he has no interest in worldly regret. So when Esau responded, he, did, he didn't do it in such a way that it communicated genuine repentance over his offense. He simply regrets that he lost his birthright and his blessing as the firstborn son. So it wasn't repentance that Esau sought with tears it's only what he lost to his brother Jacob, his father's blessing. True repentance. If you want to know what true repentance is, it's hatred. It's hatred towards the hatred of sin. Tears alone don't signal repentance. I've seen a lot of people, and I myself have been guilty about it, who've been brokenhearted over their sin. Feel bad 
about what they've done. But they didn't repent. Why? Because they didn't agree with God about what their sin is. They don't understand that their sin demonstrates a need for Jesus. Yes, they may show regret, but they're unwilling to repent. And so this is the warning the author presents to us in the person of Esau. Don't be like Esau. If you've done something wrong, if you've messed up, if you've sinned, repent. Hate that sin. Don't regret it. Hate it. God wants to see that humble heart of repentance. And just like I want my children to learn from their lessons and hate what they did as much as I hate it, well, that's what God wants from all of you. That's what God wants from all of us, for us to hate sin and then to come to him again with a humble heart and sincerely apologize, sincerely ask for forgiveness. And you know what? He will. That's why Jesus has those marks in his hands and those mark and that mark in his feet that mark on his side and the mark of the crown of thorns he bled and died for you he will forgive you all you have to do is ask so again i hope that you understand what the difference is between repentance, being regretting what you did and what repentance really is. And so by drawing now our attention to Esau, the writer now presents us with two options. Two options. Either we can follow the example of those who were faithful until the very end, those examples that we saw in verse 11 and chapter 11 or you can follow the example of Esau we need the honesty and candor of scripture not only for its positive examples but also for its negative examples as well here in our passage in the last part of our passage the writer is telling us not to follow the steps of Esau. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, heed the author's warning and run the race with faithfulness by truly seeking to turn from your rebellious ways. On completing the Boston Marathon, a writer from the Philadelphia Inquirer, he wrote this. The real joy of the Boston Marathon is just finishing, doing what you have set to do. It's like climbing Mount Everest, hitting a home run during the World Series, or sc scoring a touchdown during the Super Bowl. Yeah, that could be true. And if it is, can you imagine what it's going to be like after life's numerous heartbreak hills and bloody and our, our bloody feet? That moment when we cross the tape, having finished well, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are as well. So now let me ask you, do you want to finish well? Do you want to finish well? 
Well, then here's what our passage says that you must do. Run strong. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees. Run strong together. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. Run after peace and holiness. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. And here's what it said that we must guard against. Brother and sister, guard against wanting to give up on grace. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God. Guard against allowing bitter roots to grow so that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. Pluck it out. Pluck out that root before it grows. Brothers and sisters in Christ, guard against fleshly appetites. Make sure there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. And so here's what I'm getting at. The joy of the Christian marathon will be finishing. And it will be finishing well. It will be finishing strong, finishing together. Pursuing peace and holiness. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow believer, may you, may all of you finish well. Some of you, maybe watching, listening to this, have completely given up this marathon. Well, while you're still breathing, it's never too late. You can get back up. Strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees. Believe me, I, I, we all know how tiring it can be. And, and the Lord knows, too. You know what? He's there to cheer you on. And we have a cl great cloud of witnesses, too, that are cheering you on. Have people, you have people around you who want to help you, encourage you. So st get away, stay away from those people who are just trying to bring you down. And begin to surround yourself with those who are going to lift you up, who are going to cheer you on. Find a church where you're going to have that, account that accountability where you can fellowship, join that men's study, that women's study. Go to those conferences where you, you can encourage one another. You will be strengthened by those, by not just the Lord, by, by those who really love you, that have that agape love towards you. So again, I ask you just to get up and go. It doesn't matter how bloodied you are and how many bruises you are, you have, how many times you've fallen, get back up and just keep running that marathon. The joy at the end of that marathon will exceed every expectation you have or that you can dream of. And it's going to be well worth it. All those bruises, all those cuts, all those scrapes are going to be well worth it. So let me encourage you again to keep running. There are those who are probably watching that, you know, never given thought about it. I've never thought about it or I've never given much thought to it. You now understand what the difference between regret 
and repents is. And it grieves your heart. And you want to receive forgiveness. But let me tell you, Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of all your sins. Not just part of them, not just pieces of them, but all sins, past, present, and future sins. And he will forgive you. All you got to do is ask. Trust in him. Believe in him. Make him the Lord of your life. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit will come and make his, will come in, into your life, into your heart, and make his home in you. And you will be born again. And eternity will be guaranteed. Eternity in God's kingdom will be guaranteed for you if you sincerely and truly believe and ask for forgiveness. So, if you're ready, if you know your need for a Savior, and you're ready to do that, you're ready to be forgiven of all your sins, you want to repent and start to hate that sin, you now hate it and want to just turn from it and begin living for God, I want to invite you to the cross and ask Jesus to forgive you by leading you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit my sins to you now. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins and that three days later you rose from the dead. I truly repent for my sins. And I confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me to the brim with the Holy Spirit. Actually, may the Spirit just overflow from every part of my life so that, again, not only you will instruct me and teach me, but also so that others will see and glor see you in me and glorify you. And, and that my testimony will lead others to the cross. Thank you for all you did for me and for giving me for my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, welcome. Welcome to the family of God. You're now my brother and sister in Christ, and there is a huge celebration in heaven right now for you. And so we want to hear about it. We want to know that you prayed that, how you prayed that. We want to hear a little bit of your, your testimony. Um, and if you need help now, finding a church where you can go and grow as a new believer, I will give you some resources. I will help you find a church in your area where you can go. 
if you're not sure about you know kind of Bible you should get or whether you have the right Bible, we can talk about that. I send you one of ours. Yeah. Um, but if you just need prayer, you need guidance, direction, I want to help you with that too. If you're here locally, we want to invite you to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel here in the northeast, northeast El Paso, the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway, Gateway South. You know, you'll be welcomed here. You'll be loved here. You will grow here as a believer. So come check us out. Even if you just want to visit and, and see what, how we do things, we you know, want to invite you for that as well. So, but for now, I just want to thank you for checking out this message, being with us this Sunday, or whatever, again, day it is that you're watching this or hearing this. Um, I hope that it blessed you. Um, may you have a great week. May you have... Uh, may you be blessed uh, in, in tremendous ways, abundantly. And if, again, if you need anything, please reach out to us. Looking forward to seeing you all again next week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.